if you all are very familiar with uh, blockchain, so uh, tell me I can speed it up uh, or I can uh, slow down a little bit, but it helps mindset where you are, what you are trying, what we are trying to do with, with blockchain. So to begin with is the very first thing is what's blockchain? So my view for blockchain is that it is just like the name. So it's a chain of blocks uh, and they are chained together. The brilliance in how we chained those blocks together lies in the hash. So every block, like you can see in the presentation uh, here, has a, a group of data. <clears throat> and that usually is a fixed size group of data. A hash is a way to represent that data. It does, it's one way, meaning you cannot really uh, take a hash and convert it back into the content of the block itself. However, if you change a single letter in that uh, block, the hash will be busted for it. So this is quite important. So for example, if you put in uh, the Moby Dick or the Constitution, it, uh, you can get the exact same length hash for both of them, but they are different. And that is the only thing that tells you that those are two different pieces. And the brilliance is we've taken the hash from the first block, and then we put it as the very first item in the second block. And then we fill the second block. Once that second block is filled, you basically hash that entire block and create the block for the second hash. Then you take it, go the third, the fourth, and so forth. What that uh, does is if any, uh, any of the previous blocks are changed, the hash will change. It will bust the hash for that block and subsequently bust the hash for the following blocks forever. So that's what we call about immutability, that it cannot be changed because once it is written, you cannot really change uh, what has been written. It's written in, in stone. Um, and that, that is really, really brilliant. Um, then how do we agree around that? If you had only one record of them, so if I'm keeping the record, so think about it as an Excel sheet or Google sheet, I'm, and I'm like putting the records there. If I am the record keeper, then there is a chance for me to be corrupt. Uh, Peter will come and say like, hey, uh, here is a uh, hundred, change the facts. So I can go and change the fact and nobody would know and we can point uh, to it. However, in blockchain, what we do is we have multiple, uh, uh, multiple of, of those same records being recorded by different uh, nodes. So each of those nodes are doing the exact same thing. They are trying to record the block the, uh, with every new block there, and they have a record of what has happened. And in order for them to agree together, you have to have consensus between them. So the consensus algorithms that are used are, are basically used so that we can agree on the facts and we can agree on what is actually happened out of that. That's why you hear, you hear a lot about like 51% attack. What does that mean? It means that somebody was able of either controlling or coercing more than 50% of the uh, uh, network. And hence in the consensus algorithm, they were, uh, uh, they were able of changing uh, the facts after they have been uh, written. That is very uh, small chance in big chains like blockchain, uh, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, and so forth, uh, um, Casper. But there is a chance for that in smaller chains that does not have a lot of uh, nodes or validators. So for example, you hear more about attacks happening on uh, Ethereum Classic, but you don't hear it on Ethereum. Uh, you hear things that uh, uh, happen on smaller ones because you are able of getting them. So the strength is truly in numbers in that aspect. Um, the primary uh, consensus algorithms that we have came up up till now are things like proof of work, proof of stake, uh, delegated proof of stake, and uh, proof of renewable. Proof of work is where basically you would, uh, uh, the, the concept is in order for you to protect the network, you would wanna make it so that the, uh, uh, the effort, the cost to attack the network is more than the payout, is more than the actual price afterwards. So how do we do that? Uh, proof of work, forced people to actually do a lot of work in order for them to come up with a block. And by coming up with a block, meaning getting that hash that we talked about at the previous time. 
So, uh, uh, so by you spending your work to uh, come up with with the block and the hash, if you were part of that attack, you will basically lose all all of that work in the attack if it fails. Uh, 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 and that currently is using a lot of energy. Why it is using a lot of energy? Because the proof of work it's not like manu manual work; it's computational work. Computational work requires a lot of uh, bandwidth and processing power and energy. That's why we are consuming that energy in order to secure the network. And that was very, very uh, attempt, very good on how it works. However, we moved, evolved from there, uh, there to something called proof of stake. So proof of stake is uh, where each uh, of the nodes would stake some of their uh, uh, tokens and say like, yes, I'm telling the truth. Here are my tokens. And if I lie, then you can slash my tokens and take them away. That, of course, reduces the uh, energy consumption dramatically by doing so. And uh, uh, most of the newer blockchains are moving into that, like, for example, Casp. Um, and Ethereum itself is, is due for uh, upgrade in, uh, in August. Then uh, delegated proof of stake is where you delegate your stake to somebody so that they can act on your behalf but uh, your stake will be slashed if they lie. And in all of those, there are rewards. So the rewards in case of proof of work is uh, you get tokens once you finish. So that's where you hear about the, uh, the halving for uh, Bitcoin every four years, roughly. The amount of rewards for you gets uh, slashed by half uh, in anticipation of the appreciation of the token. Uh, proof of stake is the same thing. Uh, delegated proof of stake is the same thing. You get tokens as a reward, but then the delegator would receive a part of that and part is uh, kept by the actual node that is performing the work. Proof of renewable is my own uh, invention. And that's basically uh, utilizes renewable energy instead of uh, using uh, non-renewable energy. And uh, the whole premise there is it secures first <laughs> produced and consumed is renewable in order for it to uh, to actually be uh, possible for it to work on the on the uh, block so those were very important to understand how we uh, work with the consensus then the next question would be okay we hear a lot about uh, the smart contract so what are smart contracts well you'll be surprised to know that smart contracts aren't smart and they are not contract either uh, they are basically a script, a script that tells you uh, how you work with uh, the network uh, underneath it. And it's quite important because of a couple of factors. One, it is uh, it provides finality, so you don't need any external uh, source in order for it to conduct the transaction. And it's, uh, it provides immutability. Immutability basically means that once it is done, you cannot undo it. Once you've agreed to something, cannot undo it. We have uh, the entire legal industry is built on people entering into contractual agreements and then coming back at the end in breach of contract. Here, you cannot really breach the contract because if it is well written, it will execute exactly what the people that created it intended for it to be. So, and just to kind of like wrap your mind around it, uh, we've created uh, uh, the digital assets there, and then we've created contract that acts on them. That's very powerful, why? Because for the very first time in history, we are able of creating digital assets. What does it mean, digital assets? Well, we are used to digital files, meaning that if I take a, a picture of a dollar, I can send you that dollar to everybody on this uh, Zoom call. However, uh, I don't own that picture, you don't own that picture. It does not have any value to it uh, beside transient value of like convenience me sending it to you. So however, blockchain is the very first embodiment of how can we create a, a true digital asset, not a digital file. It has uh, an owner. It can be only moved once. You cannot double spend it and you can move it from one to the other. And that allowed us to now transact on them using those smart contracts that we talked about before. There are two types fundamentally of fungible uh, of assets, fungible and non-fungible. What are those? So fungible assets are uh, cryptocurrencies, 
tokens, all the uh, hoopla that you hear in the market about them. They started with Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, uh, and, and uh, Zcash, and a whole bunch of them. Uh, Casper Networks use CSPR, for example, uh, for it. And uh, the main uh, characteristics of a fungible asset lies in its fungibility, meaning that you can interchange them. So if you hold $2 bills, they are completely interchangeable with each other. If I, that you cannot distinguish between one dollar bill, the other dollar bill in any aspect that it does, except for both of them have a serial number and that serial number is different. So that's the only thing that you can see there, but you can trade them. That's why they call them fungible. It, you can pay with them. It's easy, same things, and they are divisible and so forth. So in contrast to that, we have something like non-fungible assets. Non-fungible assets are uh, NFTs usually, the, so that's the naming basically, non-fungible. Um, and the very first implementation of which is basically the, the, the uh, uh, having them in the format of an artwork. So uh, you hear about the CryptoKitties, which was one of the early implementations of a game on the Ethereum network for uh, using uh, non-fungible tokens. And that almost brought the network to its knees. The Board Ape Club was uh, issued just uh, a few weeks ago, and it almost brought the network to its knees uh, as well. And it uh, exploded in, in value and utility. Why? Well, the difference between fungible and non-fungible is that the non-fungible are not equal. So they might be of the same group, but they are not equal. Uh, and that's quite important. Uh, an example that I like to use is if you are looking at a Picasso. So you have two Picassos. They are done by the same artist, but they are not equivalent. Although they are Picassos, but one might be 10 times more valuable than the other, different size, different things on it. So that's what makes it non-fungible. Uh, NFTs are not kind of like uh, just graphics and so forth, they're not JPEGs, but they have a ton of utility underneath them. Uh, like for example, embodying your, your, your um, uh, deed for your house or uh, using them as uh, a way to uh, embody contracts for, uh, in, in the system that we will talk about in a second here. So that created something different. So the main point here is creating digital assets just like creating uh, digital paper and like paper you could take a, a sheet of paper print a dollar on it becomes fungible becomes money or you can uh, print a picasso on it and then it becomes non-fungible both are done okay. the exact same uh, so so basically, that's the, uh, the difference uh, between them. So um, now for the more exciting stuff. Now you have your, 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 you want to get those digital assets. How do you deal with them? Well, Hot Diggity Dog is an actual store here in Nashville. This is the picture of it. And uh, it, it closed, unfortunately, uh, during the pandemic. So you need a digital wallet for it meaning that a digital wallet to host all your digital assets that we've created. And, uh, and digital wallets, there are a few key points that you need to also understand around those things, like how do you create them using a seed phrase? Uh, what's a seed phrase? It's, a, it's usually 12 or 24 mnemonic phrases that allow you to recreate your seed. Why is that important? Because uh, if, you, if you give them to somebody, they can steal your money, they can recreate it. Also, it's a way for you to back up all your information. So your the old wallet was made out of leather. Your new wallet is made out of code. And the public key allows you to identify your actual wallet. So just like your phone, if you give them your phone number, they can call you on it. They don't own your phone. You have a password on your phone and you can use that your private key. Um, so that gets us into the DAOs. Before I go into the DAOs, any questions so far, like uh, for the uh, pieces that we talked about? I'll wait for like a couple minutes here. Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Adele, uh, for, for the introduction. C uh, could you clarify the difference between seed phrase and 
the keys again, public or private? Yes. So the when you are creating a digital wallet, uh, the digital wallet has two uh, artifacts that are generated from it. Those two artifacts are the, the public key that uh, distinguishes this, this wallet and the private key. The private key allows you to sign the transactions. And when you do a signature with your private key, it would match your public key. The reason that we have a public key is for anybody can take a signature and take your public key and say like, yes, those are both the same. And your private key is, is yours. If, uh, uh, if I wanted to send you some uh, CSPR, for example, I have to have my private key to sign the transaction with. Otherwise, network, when you send an order to the network, say like, move some, go into my wallet, move some of my uh, assets into your wallet, it will say, great, before I do that, prove that you are the owner of this wallet, sign the transaction. So I would use my private key to sign the transaction. The network will say, okay, let me see that signature because I don't need to know your private key. I can see the signature and I can see your public key. And both together, I can figure out that yes, uh, this looks like it has been signed by the private key of that public key pair, meaning that yes, you have the uh, public uh, private key and then the network will actually execute on the transaction or it will reject it because the signatures don't match. And this is a key, key fundamental piece in thinking how we actually uh, work because um, the, the, the public key is on the open. Uh, the assets are uh, possible for somebody to go through a scanner and figure out which assets are where. So in order for us to protect it without me having to send you my password, my private key, that, that required a mechanism of two pieces to secure it. Uh, via cryptography. The seed phrase is what I use to create those pair. So when I start to create this an algorithm that you supply it with the seed phrase and it pops out on the other side, both the public key and the private key. So that's the difference between them. You never use the seed phrase to sign any transactions. You usually either you create this, the, the a seed phrase and then use uh, uh, the algorithm to generate those public private key pair, or you go to like MetaMask or uh, Casper Signer, and when you create it, it generates those for you and you have to keep it in a safe place. So if, if I send you my public key, uh, you will not be able of doing anything except sending me money, please do. Um, if I send you my private key, you will be able of transacting on my wallet if you knew which public key this is corresponding to. Uh, so you have to understand to figure that other piece of information. If I send you my seed phrase, you will be able to completely control my wallet and take it over without me telling you anything else around it. Uh, clear? Great, right. thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? Um, I was wondering uh, if I got uh, if I got that correctly, you uh, said that we can incorporate contracts in NFTs. Can you maybe elaborate it on a bit more? So that's a, a, a really good question. That's why I wanted to make sure that we understand that both fungible and non-fungible, like so uh, tokens and uh, NFTs are both the same thing. So the, the main difference, if you are talking about uh, Ethereum, for example, uh, the fungible ones are ERC20 uh, and the non-fungible ERC721. Uh, 7, uh, Similarly, on the Casper network, it's uh, either uh, the CEP47 uh, for the NFTs. What does that mean? It's a standard. It's how you create the standard of what the token will contain. And with an NFT, the token structure says beside uh, the token number, all of that stuff, you have a, a, a link, a pointer to the image that would look like on him and a few other properties for them. That means that both of them can be acted upon using a smart contract. Remember, smart contract is basically a piece of code and you can agree on it. An example of that, the very famous one is the ICOs. So you can come in and say like, I'll send some Ethereum and you send me your token in an exchange or a swap contract. 
So a swap contract where you uh, basically do a transaction between multiple parties, or if I wanted to sell you my NFT without knowing you. So think about like, if I wanted to send you my NFT, so you wanna do a, an NFT purchase. In the old way, I would have to get on the phone with you somehow and say, hey, I wanna buy your NFT. And you say like, great, uh, I'll sell it to you for, I don't know, a thousand uh, CSPR. So I say like, great, I agree on that. Uh, so you will tell me, send me this uh, the thousand CSPR. I transfer the thousand CSPR, and then you don't reply. So you took in my money, and you did not send me your uh, the NFT. Uh, in that scenario, that would not work. And because of the immutability of the network, and because we are dealing on the internet, I might not know you, or you might be sending me say like, hey, I'm a Nigerian yes. prince or something like that. I, I send me some money so I can send you a million dollars. Uh, so in order to avoid that, we create a contract, a smart contract. In that smart contract, there will be a condition. Condition says party A sends a thousand CSPR, party B sends the uh, NFT token. And once those are sent, um, party A would receive the NFT, party B would receive the uh, thousand CSPR. And it's all in the code. You can see it, you can review that that would work. Uh, and then instead of me and you, instead of me having to have trust in you, I would have trust in the network. That's why, why blockchain to begin with stemmed from the trust networks, in my opinion. So the trust is baked into the network. You don't have to trust the counterparty. That is also a, a really fundamental point. Why? Because in many situations, as we, like from thousands of years ago, the entire governance, regulation, all of the stuff stemmed just to assure that there is a trust in the system. So when you go to the market and you buy things in order for you, for somebody not to send you, to sell you a lemon, you had to make sure there's the authorities, there's a way to get back your, your money, there is laws and regulation that you need to comply with. But those rules and regulation, usually you comply with them after the fact and requires a lot of money and, and a lot of intermediary in between. Blockchain simplifies this entire process because the entire thing is coded into the contract. When you go into the contract, enter into a contractual agreement with a counterparty and fulfill your requirements, everything is done. And that reduces significantly. The, uh, the middleman reduces the requirement to control all of the stuff which makes things move more smoothly. When things move more smoothly, the uh, monetary velocity in the system becomes much higher. So the amount of commerce that can be implemented on a blockchain system is a couple order of magnitudes higher than what exists right now. So, and, and just to corroborate that, look what, what the internet did to commerce versus what, uh, what the blockchain is gonna do to the internet as it's today. Clear? Yes, yes. thank you very much. It's very interesting. <laughs> sure. Uh, any other questions? Peter pays me by questions, so. <laughs> some more. Well, let's pay you in track tokens. That'll take it. Then we can go really far. No, I'm joking. <laughs> track, for those of you who've heard me mention, is our, is our stellar based token that we that we've got for supply chain tracking, but it's intentionally at a really tiny value per token. <laughs> right. So let's now go into uh, into uh, DAOs then. So what are DAOs? DAOs are just like the name. It's decentralized autonomous organization. It's a fancy way to talk about it. And basically, sometimes they call them decentralized autonomous corporation. It tries to bring the aspect of uh, organizations into blockchain. See. With the first couple of things that we've done, we've created digital assets. We've created uh, ways to manipulate those digital assets via smart contracts. We've created types of digital assets. We started replicating everything that exists in the old system, like uh, lending loans, uh, staking, and then even more like flash loans and all of that stuff. The only missing piece is how do you create an organization? How you can govern this entire thing? And like what we've done with it before, we started thinking about organizational aspects of 
the blockchain? How can we govern blockchain? Because there are no LLCs or C corps on the blockchain. And this is a really interesting part because blockchain is like the virtual world. And what we've been doing is we've been moving from the physical into the metaphysical. And that's basically one other requirement. We know we've done the money, we've done the assets. Now we need to do governance on the metaphysical uh, world around you. One of the very first one was uh, the DAO that was created back on the Ethereum in uh, 2016. That was hacked and uh, a ton of Ethereum was stolen at that point in time. Uh, and that actually what precipitated the fork into uh, Ethereum Classic. So when you go and look at like, hey, there is Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, Ethereum Classic is 50 bucks, Ethereum is $2,000, is because they had to fork in order to mitigate that issue. And up till today, the Ethereum Classic network has less numbers of validators, hence it's more prone to attacks than Ethereum network itself. So with that, uh, point. Now let's talk about the governance. How do we want to govern a DAO? So DAO governance, uh, there are models for it, and they can you can either use tokens for it, NFTs. The entire idea around that is a DAO does not have a head, does not have a, a, a tail. It's supposed to be a headless organization where the agreements are uh, reached by. Uh, some sort of a mechanism of consensus voting within the system to create a, a decision. And once that decision is done, it should be enforced through the system. So let me kind of like take that one more uh, level. The reason that I went through the whole introduction is because the mechanism for voting is either done by uh, fungible tokens, a, a, some sort of a token or non-fungible token, which is an NFT or something like that. And the enforcement of which the decision that you make would be via smart contracts. So when you create your smart contract, that becomes a mechanism. In it. If in your smart contract says, uh, you know, like Dr. Adele can make any vote that they like, then bam, that will short circuit the entire uh, DAO into uh, a, a complete uh, uh, autocracy. Or um, so. But if you write it the right way, you can actually figure out how you create a different type of governance, which is really, really interesting because you can start with simple ones and then you can move into things that you cannot uh, replicate easily within the current system. So what are we talking about? So first, before we go there, we need to think about, okay, you talk about DAOs and all of the stuff. What are the legal status of a DAO? So how does a DAO talk with the outside world? Because it is in a metaphysical uh, format, but it, we live in the physical, unfortunately, so far. So uh, how does it interact? As long as the DAO is not paying someone or receiving payment from someone, then it does not enter into uh, contractual agreements outside. Then it lives its own uh, universe and has no issues there. However, once you start to pay uh, 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 people for doing things or make decisions like buying uh, assets or land or stuff like that, then you would need definitely to have an interface. So, uh, uh, so then basically uh, uh, we need to create a structure for it. In the US, Wyoming was the very first one that actually recognized a DAO structure as a legal entity back in uh, 2021. And I am very proud to say that my own state, Tennessee, has just uh, passed uh, that uh, bill for uh, creating DAOs. So the DAOs are recognized in Tennessee. And uh, for all the uh, lawyers on the chat, actually, I have the very first active uh, DAO in, in Tennessee incorporated with my uh, uh, colleague, Dr. Bridge Smith. Um, as the very first one in, in Tennessee. What does that do? It allows the legal system to recognize that a DAO exists and it might function as a corporation without having to be an LLC or any other form. It has its own form. To mention here is that uh, the, the DAO has to pass, uh, to pass votes. And, and if the DAO is not able of passing anything, it is automatically resolved. 
So in some cases, that would be the actual requirement that you have to actually function as a dev. If you don't, you become non-functional, just like an inactive uh, LLC or something like that. So with that part in here, let's now talk more about what type uh, of those smart cartas that would work for the DAO. So like mentioned in the intro, the rules that are written in the DAO, they have to be written in a smart contract that we talked about it before. Those rules are not just kind of like, you know, how many tokens you create, but also when do you vote? How much frequency? What do you need to do in order to create a vote, to establish a vote, and uh, to get a vote so people would actually vote on it and so forth? All of those are uh, codes. And the code, uh, uh, codes there usually are activated by either tokens or NFTs that we've mentioned before. What do I mean by that? Well, the smart contract that I mentioned, they are not smart and they are usually passive, meaning that a smart contract will not spring into action by itself and do something. It has to be poked, it has to be activated, usually by sending tokens to it to activate it. So say, for example, we have uh, an AD DAO and we want to like uh, come together and basically say we need to uh, uh, pass or a vote on something. A bunch of us or one would send in some tokens to create that vote. And then the smart contract that receives the tokens either uh, uh, as taking to hold to them until the vote is passed then is active and a new record of that vote is created and then the rest of us would vote on it. So that precipitates a question, kind of like what are those governance tokens that we talk about uh, them here? So beside NFTs, you could create governance tokens. Governance tokens usually are tokens by which the holder can govern the actions of the actual DAO. Those could be either uh, limited supply, unlimited supply for them, but uh, and there might be ways of uh, achieving those. Meaning, in the uh, you might create a limited supply and just distribute a bunch of them. Uh, you you might create a method of saying like you have to contribute in a certain way or every new member. So if we come along and say like okay, we want to uh, admit uh, you know a new member in here into the DAO. Uh, as soon as they are admitted, we give them uh, 100 tokens so that they can vote with. So that becomes how do you create the initial supply and give them to uh, the new members in the system, all of which are governed and set by those smart contracts. So in that case, for example, we should have a smart contract on how do you onboard a new member. And once we add a vote, we vote on it. That vote is for onboarding. As soon as the onboarding happens, the tokens are minted and sent to the new member. And in that case, what's a new member? A new member, the DAO, the smart contact, does not know the new member by name. They know them by wallet. That's why the wallet is important. So that is the wallet to which the tokens will be sent uh, through. What are those governance models? So this is, in my own opinion, there are a few ways to look at how do you model the, uh, the governance tokens. Uh, one of them is like one token, one vote. One of them is token weighted votes. Basically, you have certain tokens, they are fungible, you can buy them and you can create that. An example of uh, token weighted votes would be uh, the MakerDAO, for example. So uh, you can use your votes for this. Uh, uh, Lux is another one um, and, and, and so forth. Uh, there but the more tokens that you can acquire the more vote you can make plays into the actual tokenomics for them and then there are the reputation weighted votes uh, reputation are, is a really fundamental concept done in the devx DAO as an example which i'm a va in and in it it says you have to uh, uh, perform some tasks for the DAO and contribute to it and as you contribute for the DAO, you gain more reputation more reputation you gain you have more weight in the vote. So you cannot buy it, but you can earn it. And those kind of models are really, really interesting uh, uh, around the system. So imagine in our public life, if a public servant done great work, they keep accumulating 
uh, repetition, and that's why we 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 vote for them, and that's why their vote would have uh, a bigger impact. NFT base is the same as above, but it has a whole new dimension there. So now you can have an NFT and make it as one NFT, one vote. The NFT can host uh, tokens underneath it, similar to the uh, second and third point here. Either it is purchased or it is uh, earned. And then you can vote using that as well. So that kind of like concludes uh, that part there. The last thing that I want to mention is as an example, uh, the DevX DAO. So the DevX DAO is uh, a technology system. It tries to help developers. It was established by developers for developers to basically promote uh, blockchain development uh, in the ecosystem. So a, a shameless plug here. Um, and it's uh, uh, embodies the reputation uh, model for governance. So every VE would, after they are onboarded via the mechanisms that I've just mentioned, they start to earn reputation and they are able of voting and their reputation is used to weigh their vote. Meaning if there is a vote comes in and uh, it's okay for me, I vote a small amount. If, it, if I really pro, I vote a big amount. If I am really against, I vote a, a large amount against. So I think we are running out of time. So I'm just gonna stop here and open the floor for questions. Yeah, here we go, Alec. What did, what yeah, so off? if I may, um, so I'm a bit like, um, I want to talk a bit more about the governance tokens because, from what I understand, um, in order to become a part of DAO, you have to get these, and it's not like everybody can get it, it's just you have to be accepted by the system, right? And, um, from from what I understood, if you have more tokens, mm -hmm. right, um, you can uh, vote. You have more voting rights. Mm -hmm. So it's possible for only one person to get the control of the whole DAO. Mm -hmm. um, so this is how it is in, in like in the normal daily life, uh, how the legal entity works. So there's nothing wrong there. But I'm a bit concerned about the philosoph philosophical part of this. Because um, from what I understand, all this blockchain idea is about like democratizing, I don't know, currencies and assets, et cetera. But when you come to the governance, it's the same old, same old again, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to, I, I don't know if this is a comment or a question, but it's just, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to just, yeah, point, point on that. Uh, so thank you for your question. That's a, a good question. The idea is like, if we're going to end up with the same old right now, wh why would we go through the trouble of creating this entire thing? I mean, uh, if it, it can be corruptible and the same thing there. Well, that's a very good point. Uh, everything has a start and has a direction to where it's going, right? Mm -hmm. So when we start, we, if you try to start from a, a utopian vision, uh, that does not exist, it never would work, right? You have to start from where we are right now. The mm -hmm. major advance uh, in the uh, DAO system is it's open for you to actually shape it as, as whatever you want to do. There was an, an interesting experiment in MIT where they trained uh, an AI model using uh, murder uh, cases. Uh, so uh, pictures of people uh, being stabbed, shot, all of the stuff versus the same AI model trained with the generic pictures. And when they showed the two models, a uh, picture of like uh, a ketchup stain, first one said paint stain, the second one said blood murder. Um, picture of people laying on the, uh, in the uh, field, kind of like in a picnic, first one said people sleeping, the second one says murder, murder. So in other words, the, they effectively proven that you could create a, uh, uh, psyche uh, AI, you've infected the AI with your own characteristics. So that means it's more of uh, your, uh, the, uh, you create in your own image. 
However, that does not mean that the infrastructure cannot support it. The old infrastructure, what we currently have, cannot support it. The new one can actually do that. How? Well, first is on the onboarding mechanism. When somebody comes in, do you give them the same amount of tokens or not? How do you acquire more tokens in the system? All of that goes into game theory and goes into what we call the uh, behavior tokenomics. That's a whole uh, branch of uh, economic studies. And that determines how you'd go into the system. And in, an example would be in, um, in early uh, Balancer there, one couple other ones like those, uh, uh, will usually tell you use the system and you gain uh, those governance tokens. So every time somebody trades on uh, Balancer DAO, you get tokens uh, there. And the more you trade, the more tokens you have, and hence you can vote more uh, in there without having to buy them from the market. But also opening, buying them allows people to come in if they are interested in a vote and try to buy the tokens. Token price goes up, helps everybody else in the system, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's on the onboarding part of it. Or you could, like in the case of the DevX DAO, they are not purchasable. So they are not NFTs, but they are not purchasable. They are still fungible. Uh, they, they are earnable. So you can only earn them. So you start from a point of like, okay, we all are created equal in the um, DAO. If you, if you join, just like I joined, like anybody joins, you come in and you are given a certain base amount to start with. So you can actually execute your voting. The more that you contribute, the more that you vote, the more that you do uh, uh, projects and tasks that benefit the community, pair what the community votes for, the more tokens you're gonna acquire. So then the more voting uh, power you have in the system. So unlike one, uh, one token, one vote, or people that are able of buying those uh, votes out, the repetition system uh, forces you to actively work in accordance of what the DAO needs you to do, the community basically wants you to do, including things like the community might say, OK, uh, uh, you could buy those tokens if we wanted to do that later on if it is in the best interest for the community. Um, and then you could also uh, uh, put uh, programmatic things in him. One of them is if you don't vote, if you don't uh, 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 participate, then others will gain more tokens. And hence, your today you have, say, 10% of the votes uh, because you have 10% of the tokens. In a couple months, other people done more stuff than you are. Now you have 5%. So that's one thing by just doing nothing, attrition, basically. The other way is if you don't participate, then the DAO will slash your, your, uh, uh, your votes, kind of like proof of stake. So this is proof of your reputation, basically, mm -hmm. and allows you to kind of like other people to come in. And uh, also not a lot has happened, but since you have not been active, you start to lose your token. So use them or lose them. All of those models, including things that we have not thought of, are only possible because we have the smart contracts that allow us to exact on digital assets that exists on those systems that can be controlled on, manipulated, moved via those smart contracts. And that's the ingenious uh, piece of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to add on to there about the reputation weighted vote. An interesting thing when we look to the DevX DAO, the example that Dr. Dell was speaking about. The founders of the DevX DAO, of the three who've, who founded it, they each have about eight to nine percent of the total voting rights now. So even though they created it, maybe it's diminished. That was a month or two ago. As active as they are in leading the programming, there's still so many other people who've come on board and become active in leading the programming that as the DAO keeps growing, the founders' uh, token or their, their voting weight is going down relative to others. Even though they are very active, there's just so many more people who are active in joining the community as well. So it's really interesting to look at how these reputation weighted votes can, can be structured and the different models for that even. Absolutely, absolutely. So in, in, the, in, the, in the end of all of this stuff, what I wanted to instill in everybody, if you can come out, uh, out of this with uh, one thing, one thing uh, uh, only is that we have now finally crossed the precipice, the threshold, the event horizon between the physical and the metaphysical. And it's uh, the new brave world out here that allows you to shape it in a whole different view where it's a level play field. It does not matter 
if you are living uh, in the Western uh, Hemisphere uh, or uh, living in Africa or Asia or something like that, you can still participate. You can transcend borders, socioeconomic uh, conditions and become a participant. And through that, uh, shape the, the future as well as change your own destiny and your, uh, your capabilities that you can do out of that by delving into what blockchain is and what it will become uh, out of that. So you don't have to have money, you don't have to have uh, uh, a ton of uh, knowledge in it, just jump in and do it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dell, for the presentation today. I just want to add in there for the fellows, and we, we talked about the idea of having a discussion of what would it look like if the if our foundation, if our fellowship program were to become a, a DAO and how that would be. We might not have time to discuss that in more detail today, but we can discuss that in the Slack chat or in a follow-up. For the fellows, as we've talked about taking what you learn in these workshops and putting it into either a short article, maybe a short Instagram post, maybe it's a video you make to post on YouTube or somewhere else. See what it, tell us about the ideas you develop and share them with the community and we can help reshare each other's ideas and amplify each other's voices and see how we can spread these ideas that to do exactly what Dr. Adele just said, just to get involved, just do it and get into these things. And Bob, if you had a comment, I'll turn it over to you for a moment. Thank you. Well, I, you know, it's great to be dialed back in. My apologies since we're about to uh, move again this summer, third time in three years, uh, back to the Middle East, um, that my time has been very limited. But I continue to be on the board and on the host committee for the World Innovation Network. And thanks, uh, Peter, to all your great uh, intellectual contributions here and there along the way with that and the Nourish Movement. Um, our sponsors have allowed me to more broadly count, uh, cast our, our webcast. It's a very interactive session for members, but that's kind of pricey. Um, of course, we're able to nominate delegates to come in person when they can, Peter, and you're on that list. But um, I, with our board meeting last week, we uh, figured out a way to basically be able to put all the broadcast content on YouTube so that folks who are less familiar with us can dial in this year and hopefully think about joining us in the future as your entrepreneurship and business growth warrants um, being among this peerage of, of serial entrepreneurs, founders and funders of large and small organizations. It's a great lineup, so I included the link to who uh, is on the agenda, some some global VIPs, some other names you may never have heard of, but their stories are wonderful. And then there's the link there basically to sign up um, so that you're uh, able to access the live stream, which will be on a YouTube platform. So it shouldn't be so difficult for you to uh, get wherever you are in the world. But if you're interested in knowing more, let me know. Um, and again, uh, thanks to Peter for, for keeping me in the loop with what's all that's going on with Ayadi. And of course, Adal, it's great to see you. Uh, sorry, I haven't been able to visit you in Nashville while we're back in the US, but hopefully, inshallah, we'll see you uh, in, in the med sometime soon. Thank you. Roman, you had a question or something? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I loved uh, Peter's suggestion to start a DAO. Um, and, you know, there are a couple of very simple ways to do that. Uh, I suggest uh, coordinate. It's like coordination with an ape at the end. Um, and it's uh, pretty functional. I think it's run by Bankless. And it could be a great start uh, and an easy one. Uh, yeah, take a look at, uh, uh, like, there are a couple of, of those structures that are uh, already set up uh, out there. Um, there was one, uh, not Oregon, um, what was it, actually, uh, Big Dale, there's, uh, I'm blanking up on the name. What, what, what was the one that I suggested, Peter? Uh, um, Which one, uh, the one I suggested? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, so um, um, uh, I can text it in the chat. It's uh, called a coordinate. Uh, hang on. Uh, 
uh, yeah, if you, if you go to the Ethereum Foundation, you will also see a few of them there. Like some is uh, Molesh DAO and uh, DX DAO uh, as examples, and then there is the Maker DAO as as example for memberships. I, I post the the link there, and then oh, the very famous one is Aragon DAO. Um, so the Aragon DAO is. Uh, the advantage of the Aragon DAO is uh, that it has uh, the ability to work on it on the uh, on Polygon, which makes it super cheap. So I, I'll. Uh... I'll send you that as well in the link here. All of those you can uh, take a look at and probably create test facilities and so forth on them. Cool, anything else? And if you are looking for repetition, consider uh, the DevX DAO, of course, to fork that one. All right, uh, it was a pleasure uh, being with you. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll have to jump for another session. Thank you. Thank you.